The combination router table is looking great at this point. Whether you're using the router table in its standard configuration for the majority of your routing operations, or flip the top vertically so that you can add the horizontal table for horizontal routing operations. But if you do a lot of mortise and tenon joinery, there's one accessory you may want to consider, and that's a handy mortising jig. Now, mortising at the router table is great. You can get accurate mortises, but the key is control. Now, to start off with, the workpiece rests on the top of the jig, and it's secured by a couple clamps. Now, you need to plunge the workpiece into the bit, so there's a pair of handles here at the top. It gives you great control. keeps your hands safely away from the bit. Of course, you're plunging that straight into the bit. You need a way to guide it, so there's a pair of runners between the base of the jig and the top of the jig. Now, once you're ready to establish the length of the mortise, you want control there as well. So, there's a track installed on the base of the jig that fits into the miter slot on the combination track. Simply slide it along. Don't have to worry about it shifting at all. That completes the mortise. Now, if you're doing a lot of mortises, you can even add stops into the T-track portion of the combination track for more accuracy. But what I like best about this jig is how simple it is to build. I'm going to start on the mortising jig by working from the bottom up. So that means I need to work on the base piece as well as the top. I've already cut those to final size. They're the same length, but the top piece is just a little bit narrower, and that's to allow for the in and out movement as you're plunging the workpiece into the bit. Now, as you recall, to slide in and out, that means I need to add a pair of runners to the top of this base piece. In order to accept the top of the jig, I'm going to need to cut a pair of dados, and I'll take care of that over at the table saw. Cutting the dados in the top piece here for the runners is really simple. All you need to do is adjust your dado blade so that the width of the dado blade matches the width of the miter bar. And I've already adjusted the height to match the thickness of the miter bar. The final adjustment to make is the location of the dado on the workpiece. And for that, you'll just need to adjust the rip vents to position it so that the dado is cut in the correct spot. With the end of the workpiece firmly against the rip vents, use a push pad directly over the blade to ensure the depth of the dado is consistent. After the first pass, flip the workpiece around and repeat the process to cut the second dado. Taking care of the dados at the table saw here for the runners was only part of the work on this top piece. I also needed to make a quick stop at the drill press. There, I drilled a series of counter bores and through holes, and they house a set of T-nuts. What that does is it creates a series of adjustment holes on the top of the jig. Now, they're used in conjunction with the clamp plate. I've already completed that here. It's just a piece of plywood with two clamps attached to it. They're used to secure the workpiece but your workpiece width can vary. So with the holes in here, along with a knob and a washer, I can adjust the clamp plate mechanism using the holes. As the workpiece gets wider, I can adjust it back. With this taken care of, all I need to do is install the last T-nut. Then I'll be able to work on the runners. With the T-nut installed, I'm ready to attach the top of the mortising jig to the base. Now remember, that top needs to move in, in and out in order to route the mortise, so we need a way to guide it. Now that guiding action is taken care of by a pair of runners attached to the base. Now locating the runners is critical, but instead of trying to do a lot of measuring, the simple solution is to use the dados that we already cut into the top of the jig. That's where the runners are going to reside. So I just need to flip this over, position the runners so that they drop into the dados, and then to get an accurate position, I'll set the top of the jig flush with the base, and then I'll simply slide the runners back until they're flush as well. Now, this top is narrower than the base, which means I have access to the screw holes on the runner. Now, I don't want things to shift around as I'm going to screw those in place, so I'm going to add a pair of clamps. Now, 
I'll just double check that everything stayed flush. That looks good. Now I'm going to drill pilot holes. And for that, I want to make sure I use a self-centering drill bit because that's going to get a centered hole so things won't shift around. So I'll just drill my holes. And both of the runners. Now we'll secure those runners here at the back with some screws. That takes care of the back. Now I'll undo the clamps. Now all I need to do is slide this back. Now you can see it can still move around, so I'm going to align it flush at the back, just like I did at the front, and I'll reclamp it in place. At the front, I'll just repeat the process. Drill the pilot holes. Grab a pair of screws. Drive those in place. Now, if everything worked out right, this top will slide back and forth perfectly. One last thing to do, pop this top off. I've still got the screw holes here at the center. I'll just make a quick pilot hole in each. Grab another pair of screws. Now we'll just set this back in place. And now we have the front to back movement taken care of. But remember to route a mortise, we need this whole jig to move side to side. It means we need a way to guide that on the horizontal table. We'll take care of that with another runner and install it on the bottom of the base. Locating this runner on the bottom of the mortising jig follows a similar process to the other runners. I don't want to do any measuring, so instead I'm going to use the horizontal table itself to help locate the runner. Since the runner fits into the combination track, I know it's not going to move in, in and out. It will slide back and forth like it needs to. So what I can do is take the base of the mortising jig, set it in place. Now I know that's where it needs to go on the bottom. Unfortunately, I can't get access to it. So I need a way to attach it to the bottom so I can drive in the screws. Now for that, I'm going to use some double-sided tape. I'll attach that tape to the top of the runner, peel it, the backing off, and then I can stick it to the bottom. A couple things I need to deal with first though. Because the mortising jig slides back and forth when you route the mortise, that means it's going to be moving back and forth on the tabletop. I don't want it rubbing against the tabletop, so I need to set it back just a little bit. To solve that problem and keep everything in position, I'm going to use just a piece of masking tape and I have a washer attached to it. All I need to do is set that in place, stick that down, and I'll do the same thing here at the opposite end. Now when I press the mortising jig up here, you can see I have a small gap and I'll be able to maintain that while I attach the miter track. That means I'm ready to put on the double-sided tape. I'll just set it in place here and run it down the entire length of the track. Now before I peel off the backing, there's one thing to note here. It's still pretty much flush with the tabletop. So when I press the mortising jig in place, it may not stick as much as I'd like it to. So what I'm going to do is raise this up a little bit. And I'll do that with a set of three small washers. What I need to do is just take those washers and set them into the miter track. Then when I set the runner in place, it's raised up. I know it'll make good contact. So I'll just peel off the backing, take my jig, set it in place, and I just want to make sure I align the end of the runner with the end of the jig and press it in place. All I need to do is remove the jig. Double side tape is holding the bar in place. I just need to attach it. But unlike before, I can't use my self-centering drill bit because unfortunately it doesn't fit down inside the track to get down to the countersink. So I'm going to go the old-fashioned route. I'm going to use a scratch awl. I'll simply Locate it in the center of the hole, make my mark, 
I'll just repeat that for the remaining holes, drill my pilot hole, then I can drive in the screws. After taking care of all the pilot holes, installed the screws, so the installation of the runner is complete. I'll just flip it over, drop it into the miter slot on the combination track. Now you can see, moves back and forth smoothly and in and out. Fortunately, I don't want to have to grab it like that when I'm routing a mortise. So that means adding some way to grip it. And that's taken care of by a pair of handholds. I've laid everything out on an oversized piece of plywood, but there's a little shaping I need to do. I need to take care of some work at the bandsaw, but the bulk of the work is going to take place over at the drill press to remove the waste here in the middle to create a place for your fingers. Shaping of the handholds started at the bandsaw. There, I used a wide bandsaw blade to remove the bulk of the waste. That left a rough edge, so I made a quick stop at the bench to smooth this top edge of each of the handholds. I need to create an opening for the fingers now. The nice thing is this opening parallels the top edge, means I can use that top edge as a reference to position it along the fence. I'll remove the waste at each end of that opening with a Forstner bit. With the workpiece pressed firmly against the fence, align it directly under the bit at one end of the opening. Then slide the workpiece along the fence and drill a hole at the opposite end. Pivot the blank so that the other reference edge is against the fence and repeat the process to drill the other two holes. Closing in on completing the handholds that are going to be attached to the top of the mortising jig. I took care of the holes here at the end of each area for the fingers, but I need to remove the waste in between. And for that, I'm going to use my jigsaw. To minimize the cleanup work, make the cut as close to the layout line as possible. After completing the first pass, shift the jigsaw to the other edge and repeat the cut on the opposite side. After taking care of removing the waste here to create a finger grip area, I smoothed everything out with some sandpaper. That means I could make quick cuts at the table saw to cut each of the handholds to final length. I knocked off these top outside corners as well. That left one thing to do. Head to the router table and using a small round over bit, I rounded the inside edges of the finger grip area as well as the exposed edges on the outside of the hand grip. Last thing to do, screw these in place from the bottom. Now I already made my clamp plate earlier, it's used to hold the work pieces in place. When you have it in position, you just tighten those knobs down. Then it's ready to be used on the router table. It means I can set it in place here. And you can see it slides back and forth smoothly as well as in and out when you're ready to route the mortise. That pretty much completes the router table except for one thing. I need a finish. Now in the original router table, we applied a surface film finish to the exposed plywood edges, but we painted the base of the unit. Now it's a shop project. That's a lot of work to go through. You can protect it simply with just a few coats of oil, which is what I'm going to do on this. Once that's complete, we're going to run this thing through its paces and show you all the different configurations and how they work. We've wrapped up the construction of our combination router table by applying a couple coats of a wipe-on finish. Of course, a router table like this is an essential tool, and in order to make it an essential tool, you need to build it right. In order to see all those steps involved, you can check out some of the other episodes in the video edition. Of course, the one thing you haven't seen is how to use the router table, so we're going to go through some of the features and how to make the best use of this router table. For starters, the large table provides ample support for all kinds of work pieces. This is great for routing crisp profiles using bearing guided bits like roundovers. 
Bearing guided bits are a great option when it comes to using a router table, but there are times I want to do basic joinery, and I'll use something as simple as an ordinary straight bit. For that, you need a way to guide the workpiece, and this router table comes equipped with a solid hardwood fence, and it even has built-in dust collection on the back. Heavy-duty knobs allow you to lock the fence securely to the tabletop. A single-piece hardwood fence face allows you to make smooth, catch-free cuts. Using a router table fence like this or a bearing guided bit will cover most of the routing operations, but there's more going on with this combination router table than meets the eye. That's right, the top on this router table is designed to flip upright and you can lock it in position and use it for horizontal routing operations. Of course, in this configuration, you need a way to guide the workpiece, and that's the job of this horizontal table. We're going to get that installed and show you how it works. With the adjustable table locked in place, creating raised panels is a breeze. Keep in mind you'll route from left to right in the horizontal configuration. Adding the optional mortising jig to the horizontal table makes it a simple matter to route quick and easy mortises accurately. The routing operations we've shown really highlight the versatility of this combination router table. So whether you're using it in its standard configuration or like you see here for set up for horizontal routing, you're sure to find that this router table can be a great addition to your workshop.